If there's a symbol for driving adventure, it would be sport utility trucks. Hi, I'm Peter Carey, and welcome to Chevrolet's Truck Track. It's March. The snow is melting. The spring selling season is just around the corner. Loretta? Well, she's back at the studio staying warm. We'll be hearing from her in just a few minutes. Having a full lineup means your customers don't have to compromise. They can pick a Chevy Sport Utility that best meets their needs. The tough part can be finding out what someone really wants. As you know, what someone says and what they think are frequently two different things. This is especially true with Sport Utilities. Four-wheel drive is important. I don't want to get stuck. Off-roading, I don't want anything to get in my way. I'd like something fun that people would notice. Can any sport utility live up to those expectations? Probably not. Hi, I'm Loretta Higgins. Sport utilities represent a growing market segment, and it helps to understand where someone is coming from when they're looking at these trucks. To help give us a better understanding of this important segment is Kurt Ritter, Strategic Marketing Manager for Trucks. Kurt, how would you describe the sport utility market and also the people who buy those trucks? Well, I guess the first point to be made there is it is an exploding market. It is the fastest growing market car or truck in the industry. Uh, it's dominated uh, quite candidly by the domestic uh, makers of Ford, uh, Chrysler with their Jeep franchise and Chevrolet, uh, accounting for about 75% of the, uh, the total sport utility market. It's also a very, very diverse uh, segment that ranges in price from uh, the low teens all the way up to uh, in excess of $30,000. So you'll not find another segment that has that breadth of, uh, of price spread in it. You know, I imagine that Chevrolet does a lot of uh, research involving the sport utility market. What have you learned from this research that could really help salespeople sell these vehicles? Well, certainly you learn what people like and, and what, they, what they desire. And, and one of the first things you learn when you do the research and you talk to the folks that own these and you ask them, what's the, the most important thing you like about this vehicle? Many people will respond that they like to sit up high. They like a view of the road and a perspective of the road that you don't get, quite frankly, in a car. And this perspective affords one to look out and to see uh, oncoming traffic, to see the surroundings and enjoy that, those surroundings. So it's this truck perspective or this perspective of the road that people really enjoy in a sport utility. Uh, quite frankly, they, they enjoy uh, the opportunity to worry about other things than, than bad roads. And uh, it does give one a measure of security as they look out, and uh, particularly in the, in the winter climes where the weather uh, may not be cooperating. It also gives them this opportunity to pick and choose an image. Uh, for women, uh, this image can be uh, the idea that uh, I still have a life. Yes, I've got kids, but I still got a life when I own this sport utility, and I can go a lot of places in this world. Uh, for a man, uh, it, it can be the image that I can be a sportsman, I can have fun in this world, but yet the sport utility all, also offers him the opportunity to take care of his family responsibilities with kids. Do you have any forecasts for the uh, future in this particular market? Well, certainly there isn't anything that I can see right now that's uh, at all going to change the slope of the curve, which is, uh, is very, very steep in terms of its growth. Uh, nothing will grow for forever, uh, but certainly with the wide array of product that Chevrolet is bringing to the market and other competitors are bringing to the market, and this measure of security that people are seeking in their lives, uh, that only really a sport utility vehicle can, uh, can answer in terms of those needs. It does not look uh, anything but bright for the near term uh, outlook on sport utilities. We would look for it to, uh, to be in and around uh, the 1.3 million mark when you add up all of the sport utilities. Uh, it, it, and the, the basic core of that would be in what we refer to or what people may be familiar with as a compact sport utility. Uh, that would account for about 75% of that number. Uh, but certainly, uh, sport utilities uh, are the vehicle of the 90s, if you will. Kirk, can you tell us what Chevy's plans are in this area? Well, we're going to be bringing a new product to the market uh, during the course of the 1995 model year. Uh, we refer to this vehicle as the Tahoe. It's a four-door, full-size sport utility uh, model. And really what this vehicle will offer is graduate school for sport utility travelers, if you will. Those people that have been in the segment and that may have been owning uh, basically Ford uh, Explorer Eddie Bowers and Jeep Grand Cherokee Limiteds, 
uh, those folks will now be offered a bigger, more capable vehicle. Uh, and it's something that uh, we refer to as a step up or graduate school for those people that have been in the segment. And only Chevy will be offering such a product in the 1995 model year. Thanks, Kurt. We'll hear from Kurt later in the program. The true meaning of utility comes out with Tracker. Its versatility is tough to match for Jeep Wrangler, Isuzu Amigo, and Suzuki Samurai. You can find complete comparisons on all these vehicles in the 1994 Chevrolet Geo Comparison Guide. For now, here's a look at the highlights. First, let's talk about versatility. Tracker offers two-wheel and four-wheel drive models. It also comes in a hardtop and convertible. The Jeep Wrangler comes only in four-wheel drive models. A soft top is standard. A hard top is an extra cost option. The Isuzu Amigo comes with only one top. The passenger area is covered by a hard top, and a soft top is over the cargo area. Now both Wrangler and Amigo have larger engines, so it's important to focus on Tracker's value. EPA estimates show that compared to the Jeep Wrangler and Isuzu Amigo, Tracker gets over seven more miles to the gallon in the city and on the highway. That makes Tracker an ideal commuting sport utility. But the value doesn't stop there. The base Tracker's MSRP is lower than Amigo's and Wrangler S. Add in standard features like rear ABS and the Chevrolet Geo customer care package and you've got a real value story. The key is making sure people know what Chevy has to offer. Chevrolet on a national basis supports a number of activities and sweepstakes that will help generate awareness and associations for our products and the areas that people will recreate and will involve themselves in their lifestyles, uh, such as Quail Unlimited and Bass uh, and our pro staff that we have out there, and people that fish and people that recreate quite, quite naturally use sport utility vehicles. So Chevrolet and its uh, activities will align itself with those organizations that will bring increased awareness. As time goes by and we get into the launch phase of the 95 Blazer, we'll be bringing to, uh, to the marketplace some activities that are specifically designed to do more than bring awareness and association for our products, but in fact will be uh, designed specifically to drive traffic into Chevrolet dealerships to make your lives a whole lot easier. As you know, a completely restyled S Blazer is being launched later this year. Chevy unveiled it for the first time at the Chicago Auto Show. Here's a clip from that press conference. I'd like to ask Jim Butler to join me over on the other side to formally reveal a street side view of the 1995 Blazer. Come on, Jim. Now, once the Blazer reaches full production, we expect it will sell about 210 to 220,000 vehicles a year. Uh, that's the that's the uh, that's that's without a lot of effort to try to get additional throughput. We think there's some upside to it, and we're very excited about our opportunity for our additional volume going forward. It's still going to be a few months before that new S Blazer rolls onto your lot, but fortunately, you still have a great truck to sell right here. S Blazer sales increased by 20 percent in 1993. Now, your greatest competition for these sales continues to be the Ford Explorer. Chevy assets in this matchup are comfort, convenience, value, and performance. Here's what I mean. Explorer is nearly five inches wider, three inches higher, and more than seven inches longer. These add up to a pretty big truck. A few extra inches can make it tougher to fit in tight parking spots. Even regular spots can seem a little smaller. And while Chevy has compact exterior dimensions, it still delivers comparable interior space. Overall seating room for two- and four-door models is pretty close for both trucks. The biggest difference is the front seat shoulder room. Explorer has about three more inches. But those really only come into play when you're talking bench seats. Let me show you what I mean. Ford's Focus models come with bucket seats. So with no one sitting in the middle, those extra inches aren't much of an advantage. So outside, while Explorer is five inches wider and three inches higher, inside those differences are mostly less than an inch and a half. The best thing to do is have someone sit inside and judge for themselves. Many people will find S Blazer offers a convenient exterior size with comparable interior comfort. 
The Chevys also come with an appealing price. Both the two- and four-door S-Blazers have a lower base MSRP than Explorer. And you get more for your money when it comes to performance. Both versions of Chevy's 4.3-liter V6 engine deliver more horsepower and torque than Explorer's only engine, the 4-liter V6. Even with the extra power, S-Blazer's Vortec V6 is rated one mile per gallon higher in the city and two more on the highway. When properly equipped, S-Blazer can pull more than the larger Explorer. The maximum capacity of the two and four-door models is similar, with Blazer nosing out Explorer by a little over 180 pounds. Now there's one more thing I'd like to mention before we finish up this comparison. For years, Ford has been bragging about its twin I-beam and twin traction beam suspensions, like the one you find on Explorer. Well, in 1995, Ford is planning on switching to long, short A-arms. In other words, a suspension like the ones used on Chevy trucks. So there you have it. Performance, value, comfort, and convenience are all good reasons to buy S-Blazer. And this is just part of the story. Chevy has a lot to offer, such as the Instatrack system on four-wheel drive models. Most of the competition has something like this, but not exactly. The basic difference between four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive is the all-wheel drive has the ability to go to front-wheel traction whenever it needs. It is an active system in the transfer case. Uh, when it sees some slippage, it will apply torque through a clutch, viscous clutch in the transfer case. Uh, to give it that, that traction in the front. The four-wheel drive is a manual selection where you are in two-wheel drive and you have the ability to put it in the four-wheel drive. Uh, so the basic difference between the two is one, you select it, the other one feels or senses the traction and puts you in. The only all-wheel drive that we really have is, uh, that comes to my mind, would be something like the Astro Passenger all-wheel drive. Uh, that is designed for on-road use versus four-wheel drive, which is designed for on- and off-road use. All-wheel drive is not intended to be, not intended to be taken off-road, and uh, I make sure that people understand that. Four-wheel drive, you do have the capability of going off-road. There's differences in the suspension and even in the transfer case. Chevy revolutionized four-wheeling by introducing Instatrack with S-Blazer, and now it's standard on Blazer and Suburban. Chevy offers two types of Instatrack systems. One features a floor-mounted shifter. On S-Series pickups and Blazers, there's an optional electric transfer case shift that's activated by a button. Both have the convenience of shifting on the fly between two-wheel drive and four-wheel high. No stopping, no backing up, or anything like that. Now, shifting into four-low is still pretty simple, but it does require a few more steps. First, stop the vehicle. If it's an automatic, put it in neutral with a manual to press the clutch. Then switch to four low. To get out of four low, stop the vehicle again and switch to four high. That's it. The shift on the floor is a mechanical device for telling the transfer case how to shift, where the electronic IP button is an electronic device telling the transfer case how to shift. Ford's choices include manual locking hubs, automatic locking hubs, and an electric shift, similar to Chevy's. The automatic locking hubs are standard equipment on Ford Bronco. To engage the system, Ford asks drivers to stop the vehicle and shift into four-wheel drive. To change back, drivers must stop and back up to fully disengage the four-wheel drive system. With the Chevrolet system, it's a matter of putting into four-wheel drive when you need it. You're not using your four-wheel drive anytime that it's not necessary. All you would do is just give a little pull of the uh, four-wheel drive shifter that's on the console of the vehicle and in four-wheel drive you go. There are only two real choices in the full-size sport utility market Ford Bronco and Chevy Blazer. 
Ford has been the traditional sales leader in this segment. Chevy closed the gap in recent years with the redesigned Blazer. Only production capacity has held Chevy back from drawing even closer. Well, that's changing. GM recently announced steps that will increase Blazer production. The full-size Bronco has been basically the same type of design for the last, you know, who, who knows how many years. A major change for 94 is the availability of Chevy's 6.5-liter V8 turbo diesel. This engine is ideal for full-size sport utilities. Delivers 360 foot-pounds of torque at a low 1,700 RPMs. This combination gives you the power needed for trailering and getting the Blazer moving. Diesel engines also help save money with low maintenance costs and good fuel economy. And Chevy diesels are backed by a five-year or 100,000-mile limited warranty. Blazer standard engine is a 5.7-liter V8. It delivers 35 more foot-pounds of torque than Bronco's standard 5-liter V8. Ford has a 5.8-liter engine available, but it's an extra cost option. The extra power of the standard Chevy engine can be put to good use. Blazer's maximum payload capacity of 1,464 pounds is 264 pounds greater than Bronco's. That's the equivalent of a riding lawnmower. And Chevy has the cargo space to take advantage of the added payload capacity. With the rear seat down, Blazer has 20 cubic feet more cargo space. And that space is nearly a foot longer. It all adds up to enough room for something the size of two adult bicycles. These trucks aren't used just for hauling cargo or pulling trailers. People are just as important. Now, Ford may talk about having a driver's side airbag, but as we've said before, that's just one safety feature. With Chevy, safety isn't just one thing, it's everything. Blazer's safety system includes side guard door beams, four-wheel anti-lock brakes, and a self-aligning steering wheel. You can check out the entire list of features in the Sport Utilities sales brochure and the 1994 product guide. Blazer takes care of people in many other ways. Overall interior dimensions are comparable to Bronco. The most significant difference is the 5.4-inch Blazer Advantage in rear hip room. Now, the best thing to do is take your customers for a test drive and have them experience the room and comfort of Blazer. There is one other available Blazer feature we'd like to look at. It's the locking rear axle. That's probably one of the most misunderstood options that Chevrolet offers on their full-size NS10 trucks. Uh, locking differential, simply put, at vehicle speeds below 20 miles an hour, should one of the rear or drive wheels lose traction, the entire axle locks, allowing both wheels to turn at the same time. Uh, customer's perception of locking differential, it's been called positive traction, limited slip, locking axle. Uh, nobody knows exactly what it's called, and I would bet that the vast majority of customers that come in don't even really know what it is or how it works. Uh, the difference between a locking axle and a limited slip is, of course, the axle physically locks, both wheels spin at the same rate. A uh, limited slip would just allow a differential in the tire speed, not a complete locking good example of when I feel that somebody might benefit from a locking differential would be somebody pulling a, a boat, for example, that uh, was on a boat ramp pulling their boat out of the water. If one of the wheels slipped off the ramp, locking differential would be a benefit to them. The final member of Chevy's sport utility family is the Suburban. And quite simply, it's in a class all its own. You can't help but look at the Suburban, which of course has no competition at all. About the closest thing in competition-wise to a Suburban would perhaps be the Grand Cherokee. And really, you're looking dollar for dollar about the same type of money. But, you know, in that type of bracket, the, the Suburban is not only larger, more powerful, and more time-tested. Now, Ford might try and change that in the near future. They're looking into launching a four-door Bronco in 1997 to go against Suburban. But before that happens, Chevy is replacing the Blazer name with Tahoe. But it's doing more than just changing the name. The Tahoe will be available in a four-door model and can be ordered with two-wheel or four-wheel drive. So when the snow that was melting earlier comes back for a surprise visit like this, you won't be stuck in the cold. Now, there are several other changes, including a new suspension, all of which will make Tahoe the target for Bronco. And we expect Suburban will remain in a class all its own. 
One of Suburban's biggest strengths is its flexibility. It can seat up to nine people or just have a standard front bench seat for three, giving it a maximum cargo capacity of nearly 150 cubic feet. Suburban owners can take advantage of that cargo space with a maximum payload capacity of 3,271 pounds. Why, it's almost equal to putting a compact car back there. Then there's Suburban's trailering capacity. When properly equipped, it can pull up to 10,000 pounds. Trailer hitches are available in a variety of different classes and different weight capacities. This hitch is a class one weight carrying hitch. It's rated at 2,000 pounds and attaches to the vehicle's bumper and the frame. This hitch is used for carrying small boats, small pop-up camper type trailers. For heavier duty uses, we have receiver style hitches like we have over here. A receiver style hitch will carry much more weight because it's attached entirely to the frame of the vehicle. This will traditionally carry about 5,000 pounds capacity and could be used for larger trailers such as horse trailers, uh, car haulers, uh, that type of uh, a system. In a weight carrying mode, it, you insert a ball mount into the receiver. And again, it's called weight carrying because all of the weight is supported right here on the ball and on the receiver itself. If a larger capacity is needed, this hitch is capable of carrying up to 10,000 pounds when used with a weight distribution system. A weight distribution system can be inserted in place of this ball mount and look something like this. Here, some of the weight is supported here on the ball, but it's also directed to the vehicle's frame as well as the trailer's frame by use of these weight distribution bars. These are made out of spring steel. Trailers with an excess weight of 5,000 pounds up to 10,000 pounds can be carried uh, using a weight distribution system like you see here. When a salesman's talking to a customer, it's real important to qualify exactly what the customer is going to be towing. So it's important to outfit the truck with necessary equipment beyond the hitch. Uh, the proper engine size, the proper transmission, rear axle ratios, uh, possibly a transmission cooler. Uh, different, uh, different loads require different equipment in order to properly and safely tow. From Tracker to Suburban, Chevy has a sport utility for a wide range of wants, needs, and budgets. One way you can make these trucks even more affordable is through leasing. One of the primary reasons is obviously affordable payment. The price of vehicles have increased beyond the income that people have to expend on a monthly basis. 80% of consumers have a monthly budget in mind when they come onto the showroom floor or onto a truck lot. Sport utility vehicles have one of the highest lease rates in the industry. You can take advantage of this with Chevy's Smart Lease. Truck leasing doubled versus last year, and we expect it could double again in 1994. Uh, passenger car leasing is up 35% versus 1993. From a salesperson perspective, a salesperson must realize that leasing must be presented as an option to every customer. Salespeople need to know that it does give them the option of presenting a customer an alternative that allows for a much more affordable payment. A salesperson also needs to realize that they can actually notch up a customer. Put a customer in a more uh, equipped vehicle than he otherwise could have under a purchase agreement because of the affordable payment it offers. So there's a lot of opportunities out there from the standpoint of the salesperson. The biggest opportunity, though, is to develop a clientele rather than simply a customer base. A clientele that will come back every two to three years because the loyalty rates on leasing are extremely high and that really sets your future. It builds an annuity as far as a salesperson is concerned five, ten, fifteen, twenty years down the road. Chevrolet Motor Division has tried to put together some sales assist for salespeople and managers in the dealership. One such assist I'm sure many of you have seen is the Chevrolet Marketing Kit and it contains all the basic sales items and cues that a salesperson will need to really get into the nitty-gritty of the Chevrolet Smart Lease program. In addition to that, GMAC offers some very, very strong training programs, either in seminar form or in dealership form, that your dealer can become involved in and get you involved in. 
In addition, we have just completed a videotape which should be available in your dealership in the near future. Well, welcome back from the cold, Peter. Thanks, Loretta. There's a lot going on in the auto industry. Let's take a few minutes to get you up to date on what's happening. It's a good time to be in sales. Sport utility vehicle sales increased by 28% over last year. Small and mid-sized van sales are also up, and Chevrolet's projecting a 17% sales increase in 1995 with full production of the Cavalier, Monte Carlo, and Lumina. Ford has certainly been busy the past few weeks. They recently announced plans for producing a 6.8 liter V10 engine in 1997. And on slate for a spring release is a 7.3 liter V8 turbo diesel engine. We'll keep you posted on those developments. Chrysler is also in the news with an announcement to start building an extended cab Ram pickup in June. Now, current plans call for an annual production of 70,000 units. Over at Jeep, They've announced the 1997 Wrangler is going to be built on an all-new platform. Well, there's also a lot of news coming out of GM. You'll be glad to hear a third shift is being added at two truck plants. GM plans to increase its truck production levels by 15%. Here at Chevrolet, the spring promotions are starting to gear up. Once again, Chevy is sponsoring the 13-event 1994 Chevy Truck Sportsman's Team Challenge. Also. A special K2500 extended cab is getting a lot of exposure at farm shows and expos around the country. It's equipped with a 6.5 liter diesel engine that runs on 20% soybean oil and 80% diesel fuel. The good news about Chevy trucks just keeps rolling in. S-Series, CK Pickup, and S-Blazer have all received Consumer's Digest Best Buy Award. And Truckin' Magazine named S-Series as its 1994 Truck of the Year. We want to finish with a preview of some upcoming stories. Now, we've gotten some questions about whether it's best to use a number one or two grade diesel fuel. It's important to know, Chevy recommends that your customers always use a number two grade diesel fuel. Even in extremely cold temperatures, a blend should be used. We'll examine this in more detail in an upcoming issue. The other story concerns Chevy's new durability testing. We have footage of a CK comparison with Ford. You're going to find the results very interesting. That's all we have time for today. As we said earlier, it's certainly a good time to be selling Chevy trucks. As you saw with sport utility vehicles, Chevrolet has the most complete lineup on the road. There's more good news to share with you, but we'll have to save it for the next edition of Truck Track. We'll see you next month.